I'd like to talk to you guys about minimally invasive cardiac surgery, which is uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, we'll talk about uh, the good things, the bad things uh, that go along with it, uh, wh where we were and where we've come. Um, it's actually been a, uh, a, a, a uh, concentration of mine over the last 10 years um, that has really uh, developed uh, and uh, is now really uh, starting to flourish. Um, as far as disclosures go, I, I am a clinical proctor for Intuity Valve and uh, for minimally invasive valve surgery for Edwards Life Sciences. Um, before we go into the minimally invasive, we should probably look at where we came from or, and where we still are. Through the 60s, 70s, uh, and 80s, open heart surgery was largely done uh, through big incisions. Um, it was less it was, um, the less invasive approach was balloon angioplasty, which provided um, which uh, before stenting uh, would provide results that were short term and would cause problems with dissection of vessels uh, and things like that. And really, bypass surgery had very, very, little, comp uh, um, very little competition uh, because uh, angioplasty in and of itself without the use of, of stenting uh, was really not um, long term, uh, in most cases, efficacious long term. Um, so we were able to have large incisions, long hospital stays, long recoveries, and that was accepted as, a, as the norm. Um, surgeons had to work, had as much work as they wanted, and their outcomes were reproducible and good. But then in the uh, early 90s came stents, and stents had started to get better and better, and now you know that people go in for angioplasties and stents, and there's really very little morbidity and mortality associated with it. So we really, People don't want a big incision. People want smaller incisions or no incision at all. So as a, as a profession, we had to come up with, with other alternatives besides a big incision like this. The benefits to traditional surgery is that it's through large openings. You can get your hands in there. You can control emergency situations. I call them SEEs. I see that in, in parentheses or significantly emotional events. Um, they're, uh, they're tried and true. Um, they're reproducible results with low mortality. Uh, bypass surgery uh, mortality is about 2% uh, and still is. Uh, and valve surgery, depending on which valve you're having, can be somewhere in the elective, in, in, for elective valve surgery, can be somewhere between 1% and 4%. Um, procedures are performed efficiently and their pump times and, cla and, and clamp times being on the heart-lung machine are low. But the drawbacks are is that when you have a long incision uh, and you have other comorbidities like obesity or COPD or um, diabetes, uh, that there's risk of infection. Um, when you have peripheral vascular disease, you don't heal as well also. Uh, large incisions uh, offer you more pain. Um, the inflammation from the bypass machine uh, causes cognitive, can have cognitive changes in kidney uh, problems. There's blood loss and there's recovery time. So was there a better way to do it? Was there an alternative way to do it? As far as the heart-lung machine goes, um, there's, we're able to do beating heart surgery in certain cases and that, even though it's through a large incision, uh, it's still considered less invasive in that you don't have to go on the heart-lung machine. But there's lots of good reasons to do bypass surgery on the heart-lung machine as opposed to beating heart. So in some cases, in certain circumstances, we will use beating heart surgery, but in most cases, uh, we're still doing uh, these on pump and using the heart-lung machine. For valve surgery, uh, minimally invasive uh, heart operations offer many potential benefits. Uh, one is, uh, which is probably the least important on here, is improved cosmetic results. You don't get a big incision on your chest. You get one on the side that in a lot of cases can be hidden. Uh, but like I said, that's probably should be on the bottom of the list. Uh, smaller incisions, less to heal, uh, less chance of infection. Um, we don't divide the sternum, so we don't have bleeding from the marrow of the sternum. And so there's lead blood, less blood loss, which would lead to less transfusions. Um, there's a reduced healing time. Uh, there's less pain. Early discharge from the hospital depends on age and comorbidities, but we're getting people home somewhere between three and five days, mostly, uh, from minimally invasive surgery. I think that your hospital stay is really not impacted as much um, when we do them open, because it's usually somewhere around four to, four to five days as well. But your return to activities of daily life is significantly reduced. 
Uh, typically to heal a sternum, it takes about six weeks. That's a bone, you put a bone together. If you break a leg, same thing, six weeks for it to heal. And I tell everybody about three months to recover from a sternotomy incision. But with uh, minimally invasive, we don't have to break the sternum. Uh, we go in through the ribs. So I tell my patients, when you go home, you can do whatever you want to do. Uh, you want to go play golf the next day, go for it. You're not going to want to play golf the next day. But if you want to do it, well, I've had people come in the office, uh, you know, two weeks after their surgery, and, you know, can I play golf, can I go play tennis? Have at it, it's fine. So who's a candidate for minimally invasive? And this has changed over time. This is the typical indications for minimally invasive. If you're having a single valve uh, repair or replacement, you are a candidate for it. In other words, if you didn't need to have bypass surgery um, or you didn't have to have combination valves. So we had aortic valve replacement, mitral valve repair, mitral valve replacement, uh, fixing holes in the heart like atrial septal defects. We could do tricuspid valve repair and replacement. But we started to, um, over time, get better at the single valve, so we're starting to stretch our indications and do a little bit more complex operations. Um, the, let me go back to this. So we are doing, we started out doing uh, combinations like um, mitral valve repairs and adding atrial fibrillation, ablation surgery, and ligating left atrial appendages, and that, those have gone well. And then we started adding tricuspid valves in. So we can do mitral valve repairs and replacements along with tricuspid valves. Well, the atrial septum is in that area too. That's easy enough. We can, we can fix that at the same time if we need to. So all of those things are now being done in combination. And we just recently, uh, over the last year, started doing aortic valve replacements at the same time that we can do mitral valve repair replacements. So we're doing two valves in two different locations in the heart through the same incision. Uh, and, um, and that's become, uh, uh, that's another thing that we're doing. So we're starting to stretch the indications. Same thing with reoperations. You'll see in this next slide I put here, uh, who's, a, who's not a candidate? Well, first one is, is somebody that needs bypass surgery or coronary artery bypass grafting. We call it cabbage. And um, those patients usually, uh, if they have multivessel disease, really need to be done open because we have to get to different sections of the heart. Uh, and it can't be done through the same small incision on the side, but we're offering hybrid um, approaches where they do stenting at the same time, uh, or beforehand or after, and then we take care of the valve as well. Multivalve pathology I just uh, touched on. Um, we're doing redo operations, but uh, patients that have had a lot of work done on their ascending aorta, we try to stay away from. Uh, it's a technical issue, uh, more so that we have, to, we have to mobilize the aorta and be able to cross clamp, and when you have a lot of scar tissue in that area, it becomes difficult to do. Um, we are operating on people with bleeding disorders. We are operating on people occasionally that are on Plavix. Um, we're operating on people with low platelets. We're operating on uh, people with other blood dyscrasias uh, that we're worried about opening their chest, and it's better to go through the side because there's less chance of that sternal blood, the sternal bleeding that we get from the open operations. Um, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, we will... We will do um, because of the risk of, of blood loss, uh, the less risk of blood loss, but um, you know, the stakes are higher because if we do get into a position where we um, get into bleeding, um, it's a little bit harder to control the bleeding through the side and we have to convert to open so it can, can, it can become a, a more difficult situation if you can't give blood transfusions. Um, extreme el elderly, um, we're kind of getting uh, away from doing a lot of the extreme elderly because now these patients are getting uh, transcatheter valve replacements like uh, had been discussed earlier. Um, why doesn't everybody do it? Um, well, for some hospitals, it's capital outlay. Um, my minimally invasive instruments are about $50,000 a set. Um, I think they're actually, they may be more depending on which set you buy. Uh, and you have to have about at least two sets uh, for that in, in case the instruments aren't sterilized right, one falls on the floor, that kind of stuff. Um, where you need to get access to another set. Um, technically, it's, a, it's more difficult because we're trained uh, through a sternotomy approach where the instructor's hands can get in there and also point and, and help you. When you're going through a minimally invasive incision, although the um, exposure is excellent for the guy that's doing it, for the guy that's trying to teach, he can't get his head in there too, so it becomes a little bit more difficult. And so a lot of surgeons are not exposed to the techniques and training uh, in their residency, and then they kind of got to get out, of, get out and kind of learn how to do it, and uh, that can be a, a harrowing experience. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been doing it for 10 years, and we've had our learning curves, and, um, and, and you know, what we perform here at Sarasota Memorial is a culmination of, of, the, of, the, of the learning curve. Um, so, 
instead of having an incision like this, uh, they, we can turn that into an incision like this, where instead of dividing the full sternum, we divide only partial stern sternotomy and make a small incision, and we can get to valves like the aortic valve that way. But what happens if we don't even use the saw at all? That's re really minimally invasive. So instead of making an incision like this, we go to the side and we make an incision like this. And here's how we do it. I'll tell you some of uh, our techniques, but I can't tell you all of them because I don't want you to go home and try it yourselves. <laughs> all right, we, use, um, we have these uh, real long catheters uh, that we place into the groin here. And uh, we snake them up using an echocardia, using echo guidance. We put a wire up um, through, the, through the vessels in the groin. Uh, and we use the wire as train tracks uh, to send the catheters, first dilators that are here, and then catheters. Uh, this catheter is about three feet long, uh, and it goes up from the groin and goes and sits inside the heart. Here's an example of the catheter going through the vein, and it gets snaked up so that the tip sits right, right up here in the superior vena cava right atrial junction. And then we go on the heart-lung machine. This is what our heart-lung machine looks like. And the good part about this for the staff and for everybody that's involved is that the surgery is done on the inside the same way. We use the same um, conducts of, of the operation that's done open as we do inside. It's just through a small inc smaller incision and a different approach. In fact, I use my minimally invasive instruments when I do open operations because I got so used to using them and I love my minimally invasive instruments so much. I got used to operating with my hands outside the patient that I, when, I get, when I have these instruments and I have to go deep, I like, it's, it's just awkward for me at this point. Um, we use uh, special retractors, uh, which I'll show you in a minute, and um, that helps us get our exposure. And uh, this is just another type of retractor that we use that sits outside the body, and instead of putting the big retractor inside, this piece comes apart off of the anvil, and the anvil goes through the chest wall through a small, you know, three millimeter incision, and then the, and this used to hold up uh, the, the atrium of the heart. Um, the old instruments, I, since we're in Sarasota, I have to do, use a golf club analogy. Um, we use the same, uh, the same old uh, types of instruments. The heads are the same uh, and the uh, handles are the same, uh, but we use the newer type with, with nicer shafts. So here you go. And uh, this is typically what it looks like. A uh, surgeon is here using the immediately in face of instruments. I have a, um, an assistant. I'm wearing a camera on my head that's looking in so that the assistant can look across the table at a camera, at a, um, at a uh, monitor, and she can see what I'm doing. My, uh, heart, my bypass uh, cannulas are already hooked up. You can see the blood that's blown, uh, going through here. And um, this is what the incision looks like, okay? So um, it's deeper than it looks because this is two-dimensional. I have a cross clamp sitting over here that you can't see as a way. That's that retractor that's going through the chest wall. This is my retractor. And just for size-wise, the, the, the entire incision is about six centimeters. So six centimeters is about three inches. Um, the, uh, uh, and the valve is sitting right here. That's the mitral valve. Um, where does the robot fit in? Um, I don't use the robot for valve surgery. The robot is very good for lots of operations, but in cardiac surgery uh, for valve operations, I find that it's cumbersome. The equipment is very complex. Um, it, uh, my equipment that we use is less expensive. Uh, the surgery is performed at the operating room table when I do the operation minimally invasive uh, versus being at, a, um, at the uh, pod here. God forbid we get into any trouble, um, we're able to open quickly and get there instead of having to undock the robot, the surgeon go out back to the, go outside and scrub his hands while the patient's bleeding. And the other thing is, is that, remember, the robot's not doing the operation. The, uh, the operation's being done by the surgeon, and a lot of people think, oh, we're gonna get a robot that's gonna operate on me. What's happening is, is the surgeon's controlling the robot from the pod. It's like this, this robot trying to hit the golf club, and these uh, are hooked up to a, uh, to, a, to a controller, and the surgeon has to control the controller, or the golfer's gonna control the controller to hit the golf ball. Uh, we use the same valves that, uh, that we use, no matter whether it's done minimally invasive or open. Uh, we are able to do all of the repair techniques for the mitral valve that we do. Um, this is an example of a valve that's leaking here. Uh, this is the left ventricle of the heart. This is the left atrium. This valve you can see has a, a flail leaflet right over here, and you can see that there's a huge gush of, 
of, um, of regurgitant uh, flow through the mitral valve. In this patient, uh, we did a mitral valve repair here. It's a little difficult to see, uh, but there's a bunch of sutures lines in the valve and, the, and there's a ring around the valve. And um, let's see. This is what typically a mitral valve uh, repair would look like. I'm not going to play you the whole video, but you can at least see what, um, where, uh, what the exposure and, and what the visibility is. Um, the surgeon is putting in uh, an antegrade cardioplegia cannula. That's what we use to stop the heart. Um, he puts this, uh, this needle into the aorta of the heart here. Um, the heart is already on bypass, uh, so that's what he's doing here. And then they put a clamp on the heart, which is over here and the heart's gonna to start to stop. This is the pericardium sitting over here and you're just seeing the aorta, you're not seeing anything else yet. Now the heart's slowly, you can see it's slowly going uh, slower and slower, it's gonna stop in a minute. And then opening the atrium and everything, this is what we see. This is my exposure. Um, this is the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. The posterior leaflet is sitting here in this uh, uh, pool of blood right here which, is, which they're gonna suck out in a second and they're doing an assessment of the valve leaflets and this is exactly what we see. This is exactly what I see. So you can see the exposure is really pretty good. All right. Um, this, is an, this is an example of a repair that we did minimally invasive. Uh, now you can see that that valve that was previously regurgitant that had the leaflets that were prolapsing are now coming in together. Well, there's no, um, there's no regurgitation. You don't see that regurgitant jet anymore. Typical incision goes from something like this uh, to something like that. So that's four centimeters. Um, here's a patient that had, this patient had a minimally invasive aortic, aortic valve done. You can see if I put my, uh, my card up against, this is like a business, a, uh, like a credit card or, a, or a, an ID card, you can see it's the, it's the same size as the, as the short way on it. And this is a patient who had a, a mitral valve done. You can see it's done a little bit more laterally. Uh, this gentleman had a minimally invasive mitral valve and this is his incision right here. Um, so uh, there's different types of uh, valves. Uh, these are the next generation valves. Uh, we started uh, back in the 60s before I was born uh, with the Star Edwards uh, aortic valve. Um, sorry, it was before this, I was born in 70. So, um, the, uh, <laughs> so um, the, uh, the, the valves have, uh, have um, uh, developed over time. Uh, this is the Paramount valve uh, that we use for the aortic position and in for the mitral position. We use a lot of this. Uh, Edwards Life Sciences probably has about 70% of the market share in the United States. Um, they are also responsible for the Taver valves which look like this. And now they marry the two technologies together to do this Intuity Leap valve which we started putting in uh, over the last six months. Um, the Intuity Leap valve is an interesting valve uh, because it's a stented aortic valve on the top which all the surgeons are used to using and then they put a frame, a wired frame on the bottom that can be balloon deployed. And so um, instead of putting in 12 to 14 stitches into the aorta of the heart which takes time to put them in and then to tie them, uh, what we're able to do is we're able to put three guiding sutures and lower this plate in sight and then blow up a balloon uh, which looks like this is the device and there's a balloon and you can see the valve sitting here and that's um, and that's done um, and it's rapidly deployed. So I can put in one of these valves and have, the, uh, have it done. Uh, here they say 60, uh, well the incisions, 60% uh, of the patients are being done minimally invasive instead of 12 to 15 sutures. And the reduction in the operative time uh, was about 24% uh, uh, in the cross clamp time. The, the limitations to this is that you still have to open the aorta, you still have to close the aorta, you still have to take the valve out, and you still have to debride the annulus, which is where all the calcium sits. And that still takes a portion of time. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I put one of these in the other day. Normally our, our, our cross clamp times are about 40 to 50 minutes when we do them through a, through a regular, with a regular valve. And I, the other day I, had one, I put one in 24 minutes. So it really cut it in half. I'm not saying all of them are like that, but, um, but, but it, there's a significant reduction. There's a trial out that just is, this trial shows that consistently low transvalvular gradients, the five-year uh, left ventricular mass, which is what we look at to show that the valve gradients are coming down uh, and the hearts are starting to remodel, uh, that the five-year five left ventricular mass remained low. Uh, freedom from all-cause mortality was 81%. From valve-related death, it was 98% freedom from uh, valve-related death. 
There's low uh, uh, perivabular leaks and um, pacemaker rate uh, was low. Uh, in this study, it was 0.7% per patient year. Um, I'm sorry, 5.3% uh, uh, was the pacemaker rate. Uh, and um, for concomitant aortic valve and bypass surgery, the pacemaker rate was up around 9%. Um, as of late, uh, the late pacemaker rate, so if you didn't get a pacemaker during, uh, in the, in, right after surgery, the risk was about 1.2% uh, uh, per patient year. Um, so this has really been our algorithm here. Um, if you need an aortic valve replacement and you need something else done, uh, like another valve or bypass, um, you're, you're either get an aortic, re traditional aortic valve replacement or a rapid deployment into, uh, valve. For standalone aortic valve replacements, you either get TAVR or surgical aortic valve replacement. If you're high risk, you go to TAVR. If you're low risk, you go to open versus minimally invasive, and then you have the choice of the two. two. If you're intermediate risk and you're young, you're probably going to end up uh, in the uh, open, especially if you're low risk. If you're intermediate, or I'm sorry, you're, if you're young, you're going to end up going to open surgery. If you're older, uh, you're going to go towards the TAVR. And that's been really our algorithm. So uh, this um, is an example of a minimally invasive um, aortic valve replacement here using the Intuity Elite valve. Um, this is, uh, they're taking the valve out now, so they already have the aorta open. They've already gone on the heart-lung machine. And you can see all the calcium inside the valve. Uh, you can see that it's kind of rigid. He's got some sutures in here to kind of hold up the, the, uh, um, the commissures of the aortic valve. And then once the valve's out, they go in and they size the valve. And um, what he's doing is he's demonstrating here how you do the sizing. Because with this rapid deployment valve, there's a little bit of a technique uh, in, in sizing. This is his instrument. This is a five millimeter um, uh, uh, long handled instrument. That's what we use. And they're putting in right now these guiding sutures. Um, we put three of them in, one at the bottom of each portion of the uh, aortic um, annulus. And once those are, are here, he's, I think he's putting in the other one here too. The ascending aorta is opened already, and that's, uh, and that's what you're seeing, the tissue that's on the side. And then they hook it up to the valve here. You can see the skirt, you can see the sewing ring, and here you can see the incision. Um, you can see that the valve, when it goes to put it down, is just, the incision's just slightly bigger than the valve itself. Uh, and the valve goes in and it gets seated. And then uh, they put down these, um, what we call Ramel tourniquets, and these are just, they, they secure the, the, uh, the guiding sutures. Uh, they secure the valve sewing ring to the annulus of the valve, and so it sits in nice and secure. And then they blow up this balloon, which deploys that bottom part of the valve and expands the skirt, and, uh, and the valve's in. Um, see, it's easy. Okay, and you'll see he'll open it up. In a second, he's going to take that whole delivery system out, and you can see that the valve is in. He only gave you two seconds there. You can see the valve is in, is in its place. So um, patients after minimally invasive, they have a single, there's a single flexible chest tube that we put in called a Blake drain. It's on the right side. Um, they get pacing wires through the same size as the chest tube, so there's no other, um, besides the initial incision, there's just one other small incision. Um, the left groin uh, or the right groin, I sometimes will put a drain in there. The patients are extubated, not in the operating room, although there are, patient, there are studies that I'll show you in a second where the patients are being extubated in the operating room, um, but uh, shortly after in the ICU, usually within six hours. Uh, any p nurses that have taken care of my patients in the ICU, they know that the chest tube output is very low after minimally invasive. And um, there's very uh, little hemodynamic instability because you're not having those um, fluid uh, shifts that you do with open sternotomy. The um, goals are early extubation. Um, we want to get these people up and moving and we want them to breathe, deep breathe and, and cough and do all of those things. Right thoracotomy incisions, they, they're, they're, it's not, I'm not claiming no pain here, it, they hurt. And so we give, um, we give uh, serratus anterior blocks, which are local anesthesia block uh, to the area. We also give um, the narcotics for the first day and some people get PCAs and that helps control the pain. Um, 
we control their hemodynamics, we try to conserve blood, and, we, um, and depending on your age, we try to, to, to not give blood if at all possible. Um, we get them to the chair on the day of surgery. Chest tubes are usually uh, removed uh, if, they're in the, if they're in the sternum. Uh, I'm sorry, if they're going into the mediastinum, which is where the heart sits, we remove those post-op day one. The flexible tubes we leave um, till uh, you go home. And the patients are usually transferred to step down on post-op day one, and anticoagulants can be started on post-op day one. So the major difference is uh, between sternotomy and minimally invasive, the sternum isn't divided. Uh, we can get groin seromas, and, uh, and in rare instances, uh, I think we're, I'm on about 300 uh, mini cases. I've had one groin infection. Um, the uh, leg, uh, there's no restrictions uh, for minimally invasive, where in sternotomy, you can't sleep on your side, you got to sleep on your back, your arms can't go above your head. Uh, we worry about sternal infections, you can't drive for four weeks. Um, you can get atelectasis of both lungs. We, we get atelectasis with minimally invasive as well. Um, we put in just sutures in the, in the rib space to keep the rib space together. And because the ribs are just separated, um, we don't worry about the six weeks of healing of bone and sternal nonunions and things like that. So um, just in a review of the literature, um, this is uh, basically uh, long-term, uh, early and long-term survival in patients undergoing uh, minimally invasive uh, versus uh, open operations, and you can see that the survival is pretty much uh, uh, consistent. Um, this is a paper for early and late outcomes of minimally invasive um, valve repair. It's a paper out of the uh, UK. It was um, from 2003 to 2013, they had 190 patients. Um, they basically showed that um, their cardiopulmonary bypass times were similar, their risks of bleeding uh, were similar as to, um, as to open, I mean, take backs for bleeding. And the mortality rate was 1.1%. Uh, percent. Um, this is a, uh, another paper uh, from 2010 out of the Annals. It compared short and long-term um, outcomes for minimally invasive mitral valve repair and replacement. There were 1,100 patients. They looked at bypass time, length of stay, 30-day mortality, one-year survival, and then long-term survival, which uh, was greater than four years. Um, and then they said that although the, uh, the conclusions were although the minimally invasive valve surgery required slightly longer cardiopulmonary bypass times, there was no difference in cross clamp time, morbidity, or mortality, but length of stay was significantly shorter by two days with minimally invasive in matched patients that were sternotomy control patients. And we find this to be true. Uh, my bypass times are slightly longer than if I were to do it open, not the cross clamp times, by the bypass times. And part of that has to do with um, it's easier to de air patients. So when you do open heart, when you, when you open the heart, you get air in the, in the chambers of the heart. And you have to wait for the air to dissipate before you can come off bypass because if the air embolizes to your head, you can get a stroke. Or if it embolizes down a coronary, you can have arrhythmias. So when the heart is open, when you have the chest open, you can get your hand in there and you can jostle the heart around and get that air kind of moving. When it's minimally invasive, you can't touch, you can't feel the heart because you can't get your hand in there. So we actually take the patient and shake the table and things like that, but it just takes time to get the air to move. Uh, it's, it's, more, it's, hard, it's more difficult to do that. So the bypass times are a little bit longer. And I'm not talking about like 30% long, I'm talking about minutes, you know, so it may be 10 minutes longer than, than if it's open. Um, this is a t paper, 2014 Journal of uh, Thoracic Cardiovascular Surgery, looking at minimally invasive uh, aortic valves with right mini thoracotomy. I'm sorry, with um, uh, yeah, right mini thoracotomy versus mini sternotomy. 406 patients. This showed no difference in hospital mortality. It showed lower incidence of postoperative AFib, 19.5 percent versus 34.5. 2%, which I find interesting. We have not seen that here. Um, lower mean ventilation times, shorter ICU, shorter hospital stay. Uh, no difference in cross clamp time, stroke, bleeding, or blood loss. Um, this one talked about is minimally invasive mitral valve repair with artificial uh, cordae, uh, reproducible, uh, and apical and routine uh, surgery, 2015 article. Um, with 426 patients, and uh, they found that they were able to do the repairs with cordae, with artificial cordae, um, in, uh, um, uh, just as well as they were able to do them open. Their repair rate in uh, patients that um, were degenerative, uh, with degenerative valvular disease, was 99.8%. Um, in this case, they had 25% uh, extubated in the operating room. Um, another one, uh, early and long-term outcomes with minimally invasive surgery, 
uh, through the right uh, mini thoracotomy. This was a 10-year experience. Their in-the-hospital mortality was 1.1%, uh, which is uh, consistent with a 30-day, with an in-hospital mortality of uh, open procedures. And their survival rate was 88% at 10 years. Freedom from reoperation at uh, 10 years was 94% for repair and 80% for replacement. And then I, I've got, I mean, we've got a bunch of them. This one was outcomes of sternotomy, which we went through. This is patients that are obese. Uh, you can see that their um, complications uh, were 23.5% uh, versus 51% for sternotomy. And deep sternal wound infection was 4.1% in the obese versus 0%. He opened another one talking about uh, patients with COPD. It showed that their compli composite complication rate was 25% lower and their in-hospital mortality was 1% versus 5%. So how are we doing here at Sarasota Memorial? Um, this is uh, our statistics uh, from January 2012, which is uh, really uh, when I started doing the right thoracotomy approaches as opposed to the mini sternotomy approaches to, um, to February 1st, 2018, which was up to the first of this month. I, I put my cases into my logs uh, at the beginning of each month. And this is the, all the cases that we've done, 266 cases. And you can see AVR, complex mitral repairs, regular mitral repairs, replacements. And then we have a con you know, all my concomitant procedures. Uh, we had three re-entries for bleeding, which is 1.13%. Conversions to open are 2.25%. Intraoperative mortality was zero. And our 30-day mortality was um, three patients at 1.13%. Um, we have done, um, since April of 2015, 168 cases. Um, our last uh, unfortunate uh, mortality was um, in November of 2015, and that was 145 cases ago. So I think that um, this is a safe, reproducible operation. I think that uh, the, um, the results that we have here are right on par with the, um, with the uh, uh, studies that I've shown you. Uh, and um, we're proud of the program that, that we have here. So what's coming down the line? Uh, you know that we have a hybrid operating room here at Sarasota Memorial. Um, we've started do it, we started four years ago our TAVR program, and um, this is uh, what the TAVRs look like. I think you've seen uh, already a few um, demonstrations of that. Uh, this is the transfemoral approach, which most of uh, which they've talked about in previous lectures. Um, there is a transapical approach, which really the surgeons are, are more involved in, uh, which goes through the apex of the heart here, where they make an incision in the side. This was actually the way TAVR uh, began, um, or one of the ways it began. We've gotten a lot, uh, away from this except for extreme circumstances now, because we've found other uh, techniques uh, to get to the uh, valve uh, through peripheral approaches rather than having to open the chest. Um, in certain circumstances, we do have to do this, and I give you an example of that. Uh, this is a patient that, had, that needed a double valve, uh, kind of what Dr. Bapat was talking about. Um, this patient here had had previous uh, aortic valve replacement and previous mitral valve repair. We deployed through a transapical approach in aortic valve. Uh, through the um, valve and valve, like Dr. Bapat was talking about. And here we're deploying the mitral valve here uh, into a ring. Um, and so this is a patient that was really too sick to undergo an operation and has really had a significantly uh, quick recovery and, and, and is doing very, very well. Um, there are other things that are being done here uh, with the interventional cardiology group. Uh, we have fantastic interventionalists uh, here. Uh, and they are doing um, mitral clips, which is if patients don't, uh, are um, inoperable uh, for whatever reason or extremely high risk for surgery, uh, we're able to do, um, uh, to clip the mitral valve and make it instead of a single orifice valve into a double orifice valve uh, to uh, reduce the amount of regurgitation. Uh, this is a, um, not a first line uh, uh, therapy. Uh, re surgery is really the best option for um, this, for mitral valve regurgitation. However, if patients do need to have, however, patients do have severe mitral regurgitation and are too sick to undergo the operation, uh, this is a, a, a therapy which is, um, which is here and uh, enabled to be done here at Sarasota Memorial. Um, in this, uh, they're deploying a clip down into the valve here, they're positioning it, uh, and um, the valve gets clipped into the um, anterior leaflet and posterior leaflet and, and it uh, brings it together. You'll see in a second they're just showing you that it can move. The clip opens like this. 
They grab both the posterior and anterior leaflet uh, of the valve. Again, they're showing you that you can position. And then it comes down. This will be lowered down in underneath the valve and used to grab uh, the, the leaflets. They'll deploy it in a second, and then it brings it together and allows them to close, so it reduces it. Um, so we have a couple of our interventionalists doing this, uh, doing it with them. It's part of our structural uh, heart uh, program at Sarasota Memorial. Uh, stuff that's down the line uh, that looks like it has some promise as well is uh, the harpoon. Uh, this is taking the um, TAVR technique. How am I doing on time? Am I I'm out? Am I off? I've been going for a while, I gotta keep going. Okay, I can show you so many cool things. It's all... So um, anyways, I'd just like to thank you very much, okay?